Hi everyone, my name is Jan and I'm a researcher at NVIDIA and a core contributor of the Slang Shading language. Today I'd like to share with you some recent advances and new features in Slam. This talk is intended for developers who are familiar with real-time graphics APIs and shader programming, so I'm going to jump right into the Slang language features and then share more details on how they are adopted in research and production projects at NVIDIA. In case you are not familiar with SLAM, it is the shading language used by Omniverse and many other research and production projects at NVIDIA. We created SLAM to address the needs of large-scale production shader code bases. As you will see later in this talk, the shift to real-time path tracing places new demands on shader programming models, which is similar to how the shift to physically-based rendering make the programming task more challenging. There is also this long-standing shader combinatorics problem. While we still don't have a full solution today, SLAM gives applications mechanisms to manage and control shader specializations more easily. SLAM's language design is a result of close collaboration with our users from the production and research groups. This process ensures the new language features are implemented in a way that is actually useful to our users, and NVIDIA research these new SLAM features play a very important role in enabling rapid exploration of new rendering features and new APIs, and that helped our researchers and developers to achieve performance goals in various projects. SLAM is focused on providing language mechanisms that can improve modularity, composability, and extensibility of a shader codebase, and enable good runtime performance at the same time. The compiler tends to adopt mechanisms that are already proven their worth in general purpose programming languages and are familiar to many developers, such as generics, interfaces, extensions, properties, initializers, inheritance, enums, operator overloading, and so on. More importantly, rather than just simply copying the semantics and behavior from existing languages, SLAM implements these language features in ways that pay attention to GPU performance. So that means, uh, in some cases, there are trade-offs and restrictions to the language feature in return for uncompromised GPU performance. You will soon see one example of this design philosophy later in the talk. The SLAM system is backwards compatible with most of the current HLSL language, and it supports various platforms with a consistent program model and compiler API. The project is fully open source on GitHub and we welcome contributions from everyone. Today, I will focus on two key benefits that SLAM brings to engines. The first one is how SLAM's generics and interfaces allow engine to unify shader specialization and dynamic dispatch, so the same shader code can be used across different types of pipelines. The other one comes from SLAM's parameter block feature, which simplifies both shader and engine code around parameter binding. Besides these two benefits, we have many work, uh, we have many work planned to make the SLAM more helpful. On the product production side, we plan to implement a full CPU code gen for compute and ray tracing shaders so we can enable developers to debug their shaders with a traditional CPU debugger. Currently, SLAM works by generating HSL and GSL source and calls DXC and GSLAM to generate the binaries for each API. We would like to get SLAM compiler capable of emitting SPEAR-V directly to further reduce the dependencies and simplify depo deployment. And finally, we also plan to provide more flexible ways to interrupt with HSL 2022 and C++. And then, on a more research-oriented front, we are looking at how to extend SLAM to allow writing host code and GPU code in the same language to save developers from uh, dealing with the complexity around shader specialization and data marshalling between the host and the device. We also have plans to explore possibilities of differentiable programming inside SLAM, which is becoming increasingly more important these days. For a more detailed introduction of SLAM, I highly recommend you to check out a recent talk by our project lead, Teresa Foley, uh, presented in LLVM's Women's in Compilers and Tools Meetup series. In this talk, you will find more history and backgrounds on research insights that started the SLAM project, 
and how they are carried all the way into uh, production to address real-world challenges in real-time rendering applications. The SLAM features I'm about to show you today are adopted extensively in NVIDIA's real-time path tracer that's called Falcor. It is a result of many years of research at NVIDIA that revolutionarily pushes, uh, forward, pushes forward the boundaries of real-time ray tracing. The details have been reviewed in a recent talk at GDC, and I highly recommend you to check it out at this link if you haven't done so already. Recently, the Falcor developers have refactored their material system to make all the key components structured around SLAM generics and interfaces. It also uses the new dynamic dispatch feature to allow its inline ray tracing and deferred shading pipelines to support different types of materials and BRDFs. All, shading, all shader parameters in Falcor are passed via SLAM's parameter block feature, and Falcor also deeply integrates SLAM's reflection API for all the interop between host and the shader. Now let's get into more details of the SLAM generics and interfaces features. I'm going to use Falcor's random number generation as an example. SLAM allows developers to define explicit interfaces that modules can implement. Here we see a random number generator needs a way to generate a next value, and doing so is allowed to mutate the state of the generator. A concrete type like LCG here can inherit from the interface, and the compiler will enforce that it must implement all the operations required by the interface. New types can be added in a modular fashion without needing to edit any existing code. Random number generator is a simple example, but interfaces is widely used in Falcor for almost every aspect of the path tracer that has polymorphism, including BSDFs, phase functions, materials, lights, light samplers, texture samplers, and so on. We refer to the functions that use an interface type like our example on the right here, as generic functions. This function uses a random number generator to produce a value without needing to know which concrete implementation it is in use. Generic functions can also be written in a more template-like style using angle brackets. Most of Falcor's core path tracing algorithms are written to be generics over things like material representation live sampling, texture LD computations, and so on. There are two main ways to, that generic functions can be invoked. In the first way, we pass in a value of a non-concrete type, such as in this example, we pass an LCG random number generator to our function. The Slang compiler has supported this case for a long time and generates specialized code quite similar to what people might be used to with solutions based on lots of preprocessor pound ifs. Note that the SLAM compiler enforces our generic function only uses the operations provided by the interface, no matter what gets passed in. It is a static error for Funk here to try to access the state field of LCG type because the compiler will type check the generic function independently from its call site. This is an important benefit of explicit interfaces over ad hoc preprocessor or template approaches, since it allows the compiler to do type checking and give clean and accurate error messages before everything is composed together. And the second way to invoke generic functions is, call it, is to call it with an object whose type is not known at the compile time. The new built-in operation create dynamic object constructs a value of an interface type based on an integer type ID plus an opaque bundle of data. We then call a generic function with this interface type to value. The user codebase can decide how big the opaque data bundle is and how to store and load these bundles. The user also gets to decide how the type IDs map to concrete types so application can make them match the enums defined in their host code. The SLAM compiler provides services to take this simple code on the left and control the degree of specialization to apply. In the simplest case, we can inform the compiler that we only plan to use a single LCG implementation 
and the result is op output code comparable to preprocessor-based solutions. However, we can also give the compiler a list of possible implementations that will appear at runtime, and it will automatically generate switch-based Uber kernel code based on our type IDs. When generating CPU and CUDA code where the platform supports true function pointers, we also have the option to emit a true dynamic dispatch code similar to C++ virtual tables. Note that this mechanism allows the user to write shader code first and decide whether or not to specialize until late at application runtime. This is particularly important for engines that support ray tracing since they will need dynamic dispatch for inline ray tracing code and still want to benefit from specialization when doing traditional rasterization or DXR 1.0 style ray tracing. In the past, we've been receiving questions on why we are pushing people to use generics and interfaces rather than just give people the exact C++ template feature. Our answer is that by allowing the compiler to understand more structures of your code, we are opening up the possibility to also generate a dynamic dispatch code for you. This will enable the users to write shader code and lay bind their decision of whether or not to specialize. We will not be able to provide the same benefit if we just provided C++ templates. If we just bring C++ to the shading language, then the user will need to make an early decision of what to specialize and what to dynamic dispatch and implement the feature as templates or virtual functions based on that decision. And changing the decision after the code is written will be much harder. Now let's get into more details on how these features are used in Falcor's material system to address its challenges. The goal of Falcor's material system is to support a wide range of materials including cloth, skin, hair, generic metallic, and plastic surfaces. The material system must also be designed in a way to allow easy extension for future research. In an extensible code base, adding a new type of a material or sampling algorithm shouldn't require changing existing code, and this is critical for a platform that supports many independent research projects at the same time. Finally, as a platform for state-of-the-art graphics research, Falcor developers need to rapidly experiment material shading code in many different forms of renderer, including DXR 1.0 and DXR 1.1 ray tracing, and forward and deferred rasterization-based renderers, and understand the performance in all these different settings. What all these are saying is that we need to architect the material system in an extensible code base and we need to be able to control shader specialization in a unified way. And this is exactly what SLAN interfaces and generics are designed for. To give you a sense of the types of materials that Falcor supports, here are some screenshots from Falcor. And this is hair, trees, translucent materials, and all kinds of BSDFs in, all in a single view. Like many other renderers, Falcor's material shading happens in two stages. In the first stage, we compute the surface properties for the material at, shading, at the shading location, such as roughness, translucency, and opacity. The first step is also referred to as pattern generation, and it is independent of, light, of the lighting environment. The result of the first stage is a fully configured BSDF that can be invoked in the second stage which takes in the lighting environment and integrates lighting with the BSDF. Falcor currently supports four different types of materials, and each material has its own BSDF. Falcor also supports four different types of rendering pipelines that needs to integrate lighting, including uh, the DXR 1.0 path tracer, DXR 1.1 inline path tracer, and the traditional forward and deferred shading pipelines. Now let's think about this question. If we are going to implement a software renderer that has this architecture, how will we do it in C++? Well, if we are in C++ and we don't need to think about any of the problems of GPUs or graphics APIs, this can be very easy and clean. 
we can define an abstract class for BSDF material and line integrator as in the left, and then implement these abstract classes for each type of a material and light integrator that we need to support as in the right. This is a design pattern we use every day, and the result is a very clean and extensible code base. If we need to add a new type of a material, we just write another class, and we don't need to change any of the existing classes. But implemented in shader code, we have a lot more to think about. First, none of the shading languages today supports virtual functions, and even if they do, they are not going to perform very well on current GPUs. So the most important bit when we implement the material system on the GPU is to think about shader specialization, since it will have high impact on both shader and host code. A typical way to support shader specialization is to use the preprocessor to control what code gets included in a compilation. We often need to write code similar to what's on the left by wrapping the BSDF function with, uh, with calls to different implementations, depending on which preprocessor macro is defined. Then to use this shader, the host needs to make sure to define the correct macros to compile the right variant of the shader and use it to issue a draw call. If we need to support dynamic dispatch, we will need to write a Wuber shader similar to the code on the right with a state switch statement that dispatches to different implementations based on a runtime integer type ID that tells the shader which implementation to use. Again, the host code need to um, make sure to pass in the correct value of the type ID to invoke the shader. As you can see, we have to write very different code in both the shader and the host based on the decision we make earlier on uh, whether to use specialization or dynamic dispatch. And in either case, the code isn't modular because uh, whenever a new BSDF material is added, we also need to modify the BSDF wrapper function to make sure a new case is supported. This centralized dispatch function is a maintenance burden, and they easily become the source of bugs and merge conflicts. As we mentioned earlier, Belcore needs both specialization and dynamic dispatch, depending on the type of pipeline it is using. Specialization offers faster GPU performance for rasterization and the DXR 1.0 style ray tracing pipelines at a cost of more shader compilation time. But dynamic dispatch is required for the DXR 1.1 inline ray tracing and deferred rendering pipelines. The problem with existing preprocessor based approach is that it forces the developer to make a decision between dynamic dispatch and specialization early in the development process, and it requires the user to write a centralized dispatch function that makes code harder to maintain or extend. This becomes a big challenge for Felcore that has over 10,000 lines of shader code, and the majority of it needs to be specialized and dynamic dispatch at the same time. The developers need better tools to organize the code base. Slans, interfaces, and generics provide a natural way to express polymorphism, and it allows Felcore to express the material system architecture in a similar way as the C++ code you've seen earlier. Here we define interfaces for BSDF and material. The code defines that any type that implements the iBSDF interface needs to provide an eval method, and any type that implements the iMaterial interface must provide a setup BSDF method that returns a configured BSDF. Then each type of BSDF and material is implemented as struct types that inherits from this interface which is similar to what we do in C++. A related slam feature used here is associated types defined in the iMaterial interface. The associated type de declaration is saying that all the implementation types must provide a type that implements the iBSDF interface. As you can see, the standard, standard material implementation satisfies this requirement by providing a type def so that compiler knows its associated BSDF type is standard BSDF, and the same can be said for hair material. The reason to have this associated type 
is to allow us to use it to declare the return type of setup BSDF method. By doing so, we are enabling each material implementation to statically return a different BSDF type. In order for this shader to compile, you need to tell the comp Slang compiler what type goes in for values that has an interface type. When you compile the code on the left, Slang requires the user to provide a list of types that can be used in places where IBSDF is expected. And then the compiler will generate a switch-based dispatch function on the right. Since the developer no longer need to write this dispatch function themselves, we are freeing the users from the maintenance burden and eliminating the chances for error. Note that under this model, shader specialization is really just a special case. If we tell the compiler that IBSDF can only be one type, SLAM will generate a simple forwarding dispatch method without a switch, which resolves similar code to the preprocessor-based approach. And this is how shader specialization and dynamic dispatch can be unified with the same shader compiler model uh, and with the same shader code. This effectively allows the shader specialization decision to be pushed to as late in the application runtime rather than before everything is implemented. With that, file core developers can write their shader code without worrying about whether it is going to be used for specialization or dynamic dispatch, and the host code can easily control that through a unified shader compilation API and make that decision depending on what pipeline is in use. For DXR 1.0 ray tracing and traditional forward rasterization pipelines, the host code runs Slang compiler once for each heat shader and specializes the heat shader to one single material type. For DXR 1.1 ray tracing and deferred shading pipelines, the host code runs the shader compiler once with a list of all materials types uh, used by currencing to get a Uber shader. One more detail I'd like to talk about is how SLAN handles different data layouts from different implementation types. Let's go back to the SLAN code on the left, which defines a BSDF interface and two in implementations. We can easily translate the implementations into corresponding struct types defining their data fields and translate the eval method into plain functions with explicit parameter that represents this. When we use dynamic dispatch, SLAM will also generate a dispatch function that calls into implement each implementation uh, based on a type ID. But the important detail here is how to represent this parameter that can either be a standard BSDF or a hair BSDF type. A natural thinking is that this needs to be something akin to a union in C++. This problem is, the problem is that neither HSL or GSL has unions. Again, on CPU, this will be easy. We can simply represent this parameter as a voice, voice star pointer and reinterpret cast it into whatever implementation type it is expected to be. This is how generics are implemented in most CPU languages that supports them. But on many GPU APIs, we don't have pointers, and even on those targets that does have pointer support, using them this way can easily confuse the compiler into spilling data out of registers and generating slow memory load and store operations. The solution in SLAN is that we ask the user to tell us the maximum allowed size of an implementation type for each interface. Here, the user is using an attribute to tell the compiler that an implementation of a BSDF type cannot exceed 20 bytes. With this information, SLAM will generate an any value type that has five UIN members to make it having a size of 20 bytes. Then whenever SLAM needs to represent a union of types in its generated HLSL or GLSL code, it will use the any value type. Then what is left is to generate the reinterpret functions that converts the any value type into each implementation type before invoking the actual implementation. Here is what a compiler generated reinterpret function look like. It simply casts and aligns the data field by field. As you can see, there is no pointer logic involved 
and everything is done in virtual registers or local variables. This kind of code can be easily optimized out by the downstream compiler, so the cast has minimal performance overhead on the GPU. This is an example of how SLAN adopts modern language mechanisms and carefully implement them in a way that works well on GPUs instead of just copying the exact behavior from existing CPU languages. We believe this reinterpret functionality is a useful feature on its own, so we provided it as a standalone language feature to our users. A user can just write a reinterpret in SLAN to bit cast between any struct or array types and be assured that there won't be any pointer logic that may confuse the downstream compiler into producing slow code. So that covers all the details of SLAN interfaces and dynamic dispatch. While we have only talked about Filecore's material system, it is important to know that generics and interfaces are used extensively in the Filecore codebase in order to organize many different implementations it supports for key features like reflectance functions, light sampling strategies, and so on. Finally, I'd like to show you how SLAN passes the material data to the shader. First, Falcor defines a material data blob type uh, in the shader code that consists of a type ID field and a payload field for storing the data of each material. Next, Falcor defines a material system shader type that provides a scope for all the material system related shader parameters. Here we have a structured buffer of material data blob to hold all materials in a scene. We then have a get material method that fetches the material data blob at an index into the buffer and uses the create dynamic object to get an I interface uh, to get an I material type uh, typed value for the dynamic material object. The I material value uh, can then be used in the rest of the shader code. Note that even though there is a create dynamic object call in the code, there wouldn't actually be any dynamic dispatch logic involved if the application compiles this shader by telling the compiler that I material can only be one specific material type. In that case, all code still uh, will still be specialized to that single material. And last, we use SLAN's uh, parameter block feature to allow the host to pass in all material system parameters via descriptor tables or descriptor sets. To see how parameter block simplifies things, let's take a look at how the materials system parameters should, uh, should be defined in plain HLSL. When using plain HLSL, developers often have to write code like that on the right. First, the shader parameters are declared at a global scope. Note that different types of parameters need different forms of declarations. And you can see here that plan O data and uh, buffers or sampler types gets treated very differently. In order to take advantage of the D3D12 and Vulkan binding models um, for performance, we need to manually annotate each shader parameter with boilerplate attributes. And this can be error prone to maintain as we evolve the code base. In contrast, SLAN's parameter block construct as seen on the left allow us to bind groups of parameters to the graphics pipeline as a unit. The parameter block construct maps naturally to the binding model of different APIs, and this is how Falcor controls the use of descriptor tables and descriptor sets for D3D12 and Vulkan. You can look at this as kind of object-oriented programming, but more fundamentally, it allows us to organize and scope parameters in a modular way. To recap, SLAN is a shading language we designed to address the current and future needs of production and research shader codebases. The generics and interfaces feature in SLAN allows Falcor to architect its material system in a modular and extensible way, and it is adaptable to different pipelines that requires specialization or dynamic dispatch. SLAN allows Falcor um, to control the degree of specialization via a unified API. The SLAN compiler implements dynamic dispatch in a way that works efficiently on GPUs and generates performance-friendly code to downstream HLSL or GSL compilers without use of pointers or function pointers. 
And finally, the parameter block feature is what makes the shader parameter binding on different platforms clean and simple. One thing that I haven't mentioned so far is that all the dynamic dispatch features require host application to adopt a bindless re resource policy, since we simply cannot put resource parameters in a dynamic type today. I look forward to a future where all shader parameters are just plain memory, so the application doesn't need to deal with this complexity anymore. But before then, it is probably worthwhile to provide a standardized implementation of bindless resources in the language to allow easier code reuse between projects. I've showed you today a deep integration of Slang's advanced language features in Falcor, which is the state-of-art real-time path tracer built by researchers and engineers at NVIDIA. I would also like to highlight that Slang starts up a project to simplify shader-related tasks in traditional rasterization-focused engines, and Slang is being used by many other projects at NVIDIA besides Belcore. For many engines, they, needs to, uh, they need to assemble shader kernel from code snippets scattered around different places into a specialized kernel that computes the requested combination of shading features and make sure that all the parameters are passed to the shader in the correct layout. These tasks are often accomplished with ad hoc mechanisms, including preprocessor directives, explicit register binding and parameter offsets, and requires a lot of developers' effort to ensure the consistency between shader and host code. Slang's generics, parameter blocks, and its reflection and compi compilation API are all designed from engine developers' perspective to approach all these tasks in a more structural and systematic way. Finally, our team is hiring. If you are excited about working with us to make Slang better, please don't hesitate to contact me. If you are interested in contributing, Slang is a fully open source project on GitHub, and we would like to invite you to try it out and give us feedback. Slang is currently used in projects that targets D3, D12, and Vulkan, and it runs on Windows and Linux, and works for ray tracing, compute, and tr traditional raster pipelines. We welcome contributions to bring it to more platforms and APIs. That's everything I'd like to share today. Thank you for viewing this talk.